Thank you, Julia. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the center. Uh, we're very pleased to be doing this webinar this afternoon. As we all know, we are living in turbulent, traumatic, and uncertain times across the globe. The pandemic has lacerated economies, threatens long-term economic disaster, and of course, the most vulnerable are tragically experiencing the most intense pain. Uh, two days ago, the World Bank issued a report uh, that indicated in middle-income countries, such as Mexico, globally, between 88 million and 115 million people will sink into extreme poverty this year alone. Extreme poverty means living on less than $1.90 a day. Uh, Mexico is among the hardest hit economies globally and certainly among the most hard hit in Latin America. Uh, in the second quarter of this year, economic growth tumbled 18%, twice as severe a fall as in the US, and the results for the entire year look very grim. It's against this disturbing economic context, this disturbing context of a pandemic still raging and not controlled that we'll be looking at AMLO uh, and the challenges for Mexico uh, this afternoon. We're very pleased to have with us Lorenzo Mayer. Uh, he is among Mexico's leading historians, a noted progressive and courageous public intellectual, and an emeritus professor of history at the Colegio de Mexico in Mexico City. He's been a columnist for Reforma, as well as the host of Premier Plano, a political TV show on the nation's largest network. Our format will be straightforward. Professor Mayer will speak, uh, and then we'll go to questions from webinar participants, both those that were submitted in advance and those that are sent uh, in the Q&A function during the conversation. Uh, before I begin, I want to recognize that today, as participants for this webinar, we have people not only from across the United States and Mexico, uh, but also from Canada, China, Italy, Norway, Brazil, and England. Uh, so with this, let me turn it over to Lorenzo Mayer. Thank you, Harley. Uh, well, I have a very little time and a very complex issue at my hands. I want to start quoting a very classical political scientist, Machiavelli. He said, that there is nothing more difficult, nothing more difficult to do than to change. Uh, he said the laws of a, of a system, but we can also translate this, this as a change of regime. And that's exactly what Mexico is trying to do, or at least <laughs> the people that is in charge of the government of Mexico. We were for uh, many years, almost the whole uh, uh, 20th century, uh, one of the most stable um, authoritarian political systems. This began to change at the end of last century and the changes continue to the present. But uh, the acceleration of change took place uh, with the electoral victory of uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador and his party in uh, two years ago, uh, 2018. And um, we are now trying to figure out what he's uh, doing and what he can do. Let me uh, show the next slide because it's, it's uh, important. Look at this. Uh, the sources, the Pew Research Center, 
it's 2017. And look at Mexico at the bottom. The dissatisfaction of Mexicans with uh, the political system and with the whole public environment. 93% uh, said that uh, they were not satisfied with the political system. So this is uh, the background of Andres Manuel uh, and the left victory uh, at the during the next uh, year election, 2018. It was uh, this uh, problem with the, with the deep down insatisfaction with the system. Well, uh, let's turn uh, to the next slide, please. Um, what, uh, according to Mexicans, were the main, main uh, problems from their point of view, the average Mexican, insecurity. Bah, the uh, problem of uh, um, lack of uh, security in some parts of Mexico more than others. But look, economy, poverty, political issues, uh, uh, public services were not as important, not even unemployment as insecurity. It was 1919, the beginning of uh, Andres Manuel uh, Lopez Obrador uh, government. This uh, big, deep problem has not been solved by Lopez Obrador, not even close to solve the problem. We are living right now with uh, the pandemic and uh, insecurity. Uh, this, the, the daily news are 10, uh, 5, 10, even 15 people killed uh, in one day in Guanajuato, in Michoacán. Uh, it's not all over the uh, country very uh, uh, well identified places, but that's the, the sense of uh, insecurity, crime, and uh, this uh, problem doesn't uh, go away. It's here and nobody knows exactly when we are going to be able to turn the page uh, in this issue. Now, let's have uh, the next uh, slide. Look at this. With uh, Andres Manuel, uh, the number of uh, homicides in, in Mexico in 18 months. Well, he uh, doesn't try to hide the problem. He is always saying this is a, a problem that we have to solve, we can solve this only uh, through social uh, programs, not with uh, police, not with the army, because we have to reshape society, reshape the lower echelons of society, the, where the poor people uh, are, we have to do something drastic. That's the now the basic task of the uh, new uh, regime of the Cuarta uh, Transformacion, the fourth transformation of Mexico, as he used to, he likes to call it. But look, it's really a, a, a big problem that comes from 20 years ago. It's narco traffic. It's the, uh, to be <laughs> close to the United States and to be a producer and at the same time, a, a, a highway for uh, drugs to the United States coming from Colombia and other places. Uh, let's have the next um, slide because this is a, a big issue in Mexico right now. Lopez Obrador is trying to uh, face this problem in two different ways. One is social uh, programs 
directed to the, yeah, uh, I'll show you some figures after this, uh, to young people, poor people, uh, try to uh, take them away from uh, organized crime. The recruitment of organized crime is basically young people, young male people. Well, but on the other hand, this is a, a new instrument that uh, caused a lot, a lot of problems, the creation of a national guard. But as you can see, uh, the great majority of Mexicans are in favor of this uh, new organization. Is is like the Chilean is is the, something that is close to what uh, we are doing right now. Uh, los Carabineros. It's not the army. It's not the police. It's a mixture of both things. This is not completed. Uh, they are still building uh, the barracks. Uh, they are still recruiting the uh, people, but. Uh, it's a militarized police. And this brings us uh, the whole problem that uh, the adversaries of uh, AMLO say, we are militarizing Mexico. Well, I don't think so. Uh, we are not, uh, uh, for many reasons that I cannot go deep uh, right now, the Mexican army is not the Chilean army, it's not the Argentinian army, nothing like that. But it's the only <laughs> a more or less efficient organization in Mexico. And uh, Andres Manuel uh, Lopez Obrador wants to use it because it's certainly the most disciplined and probably the less corrupt uh, institution, public institution in Mexico. But we don't know uh, yet if uh, this combination of social programs and La Guardia Nacional are going to uh, change this um, extremely uh, difficult situation, this critical situation of security. Uh, the next one, please. Well, uh, this is <laughs> the catastrophic uh, element. Uh, the gross domestic product of Mexico, uh, here you have uh, an array of uh, uh, countries to compare, uh, Germany, Brazil, China, China the United States, etc., etc. And we are uh, expecting to lose uh, 10% of the uh, gross domestic product at the end of the year. I think that the worst part is already, uh, we have gone through the worst, but um, recovery is going to take long, long time. Nobody knows how much. Uh, and the next year we are thinking of growing at the 3% in uh, 2021. The loss uh, is there, uh, even if we can grow to uh, um, this rate, um, the situation is going to be very difficult for the next five, six years. Um, the next one, please. Well, here are, uh, I said, the National Guard is one answer. These are the core of the new uh, government. 30 social programs. Here you have some of them, but they are 30. Uh, uh, as you can see, is young people, uh, small business, uh, uh, senior citizens, uh, people with, uh, that are disabled, young and old, scholarships uh, for from elementary school to the university and uh, programs like uh, seeding life that is um, uh, to plant trees because deforestation in Mexico is really a horrible uh, situation 
urban reconstruction, to create places where uh, young people can gather in peace to do something uh, useful um, and uh, at the same time creating jobs. Uh, this uh, Créditos a la Palabra, um, you don't have a bureaucracy, it's you just uh, sign and they give you the credit. It's not much, but there is something. Uh, what um, the new government wants to do is to cut the middleman, the organizations that were um, intervening between the citizens and the government. They are furious because there was always in the past somebody that uh, was mediating um, between uh, those who need uh, the support and the government. Uh, and here it's uh, convenient to introduce another element, corruption. Corruption is everywhere in Mexico, literally everywhere, and is now the main uh, issue for Andres Manuel. At the beginning, it was uh, these social programs or the economy, but uh, with the uh, pandemic uh, and the uh, economy going to the docks, then another issue came. And uh, he is uh, very uh, systematic in this, the fight against corruption. Uh, is just the beginning, but for the first time, we are looking at one possibility. One, it's a possibility. It's not, we are not so sure. To have former presidents formally accused of corruption. This is something completely new in Mexican history. Uh, and it's becoming an interesting issue because Andres Manuel doesn't have the capacity, the, the country doesn't have the ability to uh, confront the economic crisis in, a, uh, in, in the way we wanted. But corruption, that can be a, a, a another a issue and with political will and um, intelligence, uh, you can mix the fight against corruption with the social programs, with the National Guard, and probably this mixture will have some results uh, in, in these two fields, security and corruption. Now, uh, another issue. Uh, the next, please. Um, uh, well, uh, this is not another issue, it's the same. Minimum wage, look, uh, it went up uh, in the, the last, uh, um, year, and that's important uh, for millions of wage earners in, in Mexico. The next, here is the corruption issue. Look uh, what uh, Mexicans think about uh, corruption and presidents, uh, Enrique Peña Nieto, uh, how corrupt are these presidents? Well, Peña Nieto is the highest, <laughs> and uh, oh, it's that's obvious. But Carlos Salinas de Gortari, Felipe Calderón, Vicente Fox, Ernesto Cedillo, uh, all of them uh, are a view by the Mexican public as a very corrupt. Um, leaders, personally speaking, and the government they, uh, uh, they had. On the other, uh, on the right-hand side is uh, 
uh, cases of extreme corruption that they think these are the guys that uh, really rob us. I think that's a perception of the of uh, of the people. I don't think that uh, they are exactly the the best example of corruption, but nevertheless, it's the feeling that uh, previous government were so corrupt that now that Andres Manuel wants to uh, start a very difficult process because the opposition is always uh, well, the opposition is uh, playing uh, its part quite well in these uh, events, trying to to put obstacles to all these uh, possibilities. But uh, something is going to happen with the uh, ex-presidents, uh, especially with Enrique Peña Nieto uh, and uh, Felipe Calderón. Well, this, uh, let's see the, the next, uh, Let's go to the next uh, issue. Here is income distribution in Mexico. Uh, these two are the income distribution. You can see here uh, that um, the uh, comparison with, uh, uh, with other Latin American uh, countries, well, Mexico is not the most unequal in this income distribution. Brazil is, but we are close to that. Uh, we are very close to that. The next one, please. Here, I like this one. I like this. I love this one. I love in a kind of a masochist way. Here is the 1% with the highest uh, income. Uh, we are uh, ahead of the United States, although the United States uh, <laughs> um, is not very bad, is not doing very bad in this concentration of income, but we are uh, ahead of, of the US, even ahead of the US. Uh, uh, these um, figures are from uh, a colleague of mine at the uh, Colegio de Mexico that now is at the Banco de Mexico. Uh, and uh, another uh, study of him, another calculation of him, uh, he calculated the uh, wealth of uh, four Mexicans four Mexican families or four Mexican heads of family, Carlos Slim uh, on the top, uh, um, Salinas Pliego, uh, and uh, two others. And their richness, uh, their wealth, is the equivalent of eight point something of the gross national product, four persons. So this is something that the new government is always uh, playing with. The mafia del poder, the mafia, the, the corruption and concentration of, of income. Uh, it's a very powerful uh, political discourse on the part of Andres Manuel, because it's, uh, it has solid basis. Um, Mexico is very unequal since the colonial times, since Humboldt told us that we were extremely unequal at the beginning of the 19th century, and we remain like that. The next one, please. Uh, well, I will not uh, dwell much on, on this. We are, uh, uh, it was very difficult for uh, Andres Manuel, the initial uh, relationship with Trump because he wanted to uh, just uh, uh, obliterate the free trade agreement with uh, Mexico, US, and Canada. Finally, after long negotiations, we have a new trade agreement. It was, uh, it was very challenging for Andres Manuel, and it was very challenging to come to uh, visit Trump. Oof. In Mexico, that was viewed as uh, going to uh, 
Guarida de León to the cave where the monster was and he came alive from the White House. Uh, but this, uh, this is still a problem. The next one, please. Look at um, this is the labor compensation in manufacturing industry. Well, that's our uh, competitive uh, edge with the United States. Low wages <laughs> and very low wages. We are trying to go up because it, the U.S. put a pressure. It's, it's fantastic. It's the first time that the U.S. exert pressure in favor of labor, of workers. But it was not because <laughs> Trump uh, was a socialist, but uh, it's to, he said, to play fair. The next one, please. Uh, well, uh, our trade with U.S. is, uh, uh, is not particularly fair. Only 20% of um, the components of what we export to the United States are made in Mexico. 80% uh, are imports from other parts, even from the United States, and then we export to the United States. The next one, please. Uh, now, we are uh, almost at the end. Uh, what is uh, right now, how they, uh, they are, uh, the people are looking at, uh, at what uh, uh, Andres Manuel and his government are doing. Look, uh, in education, in fighting corruption, it's uh, protecting the environment. This is the things that, uh, a good amount of people think uh, he is doing it uh, well. Uh, the next one, please. And this is what uh, I want because my 20 minutes are gone. This uh, is a very recent uh, opinion poll. Um, would you, uh, it's a, uh, in case of a presidential election again, you will support which party? And look, uh, preferencia bruta and preferencia efectiva. The uh, preferencia efectiva means those who really vote, uh, that voted in the uh, previous election. Others uh, have an opinion, but they don't go to the polls. Uh, 59. Uh, percent are still willing to vote again for Lopez Obrador. In spite of all the problems, the uh, virus, the pandemic, the uh, lack of security, uh, the economy going to the dogs, uh, um, I, I couldn't uh, uh, send you the, the, the last um, opinion poll that was uh, published by El Financiero, that is a right-wing uh, uh, newspaper, but has a very good uh, uh, department of, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, encuestas, uh, um, opinion polls. Uh, Alejandro Moreno is in charge of this. And in September, AMLO support went up. 62% and those who disapprove strongly, completely against uh, the government is 36%. This is, uh, we are living in a very polarized situation, just as the United States. It's very similar, the, the political polarization of Mexico. Uh, but uh, this percentage, tells you what kind of polarization is the middle class, uh, upper and middle class that are uh, dead set against AMLO. And he has the support of um, this large part of the uh, population that we can call the, the uh, not the, exactly the poor, but uh, 
the popular uh, sectors, as they call it in Mexico, los sectores populares. Um, the majority, 62%, is still supporting uh, Andres Manuel. But the atmosphere, the political atmosphere in Mexico is really charged. It's like in the U US, you are for or against AMLO. Uh, and um, the media, especially the media, is very anti-AMLO, anti-government. Uh, and in uh, Twitter and all these things, well, the things they say, uh, it's very, it's even disgusting to read uh, those things because they use a language that <laughs> uh, it's uh, uh, not uh, acceptable in uh, normal circumstances. Uh, but uh, I finish with this. Uh, the polarization is uh, the uh, most striking element in Mexico right now, uh, the political polarization. Nevertheless, uh, in spite of all these problems, uh, still Andres Manuel uh, has the support of uh, two thirds of the uh, citizens um, and um, he is going ahead with his uh, program of changing the nature of the regime. And uh, if you want, it's a populism from the left. Yes, it is. Uh, and he's committed to, to that. Uh, and uh, we are at the end of the second year of his term. Uh, there are still four years to go, but he's going to submit his, the possibility of his resignation in uh, 2022 to a referendum. He doesn't want to wait until the end of the, uh, of the six year term. He wants to uh, recuperate or to show that he has support or otherwise he said, I will go. I will go and that's the end of this uh, attempt to change the, the regime from the left in Mexico. Well, as I said, there are many, many, many things. It's too complex, the situation, but in 26 minutes, <laughs> uh, I cannot do more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorenzo. I think that was a very good overview. Uh, we have a lot of questions. If we ask them all, it might prove to be a 24-hour webinar, so we are only going to be able to ask a few. Uh, let me begin with a broad summary. What would you view two years into his term, his biggest achievement, what is the most important failure or what's lacking most directly? You've touched well, on this, but okay. how would you summarize that? Failure, failure, security, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, security. He cannot handle, uh, he, he is trying, but no, sir. Uh, the lack of security is uh, as uh, obvious uh, today as it was two years ago. Um, he's promising that uh, he cannot solve this right away, that the National Guard is going to start acting uh, um, in the whole geography of Mexico uh, with small detachments all over Mexico. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, the social... Um, uh, the, the, these programs uh, of giving scholarships and creating jobs for the uh, young, uh, uh, well, will have some effect, but it will take years, years, years to, to uh, create the necessary uh, incentives for young people not 
to be part of the organized crime. It's, in, it's almost in, an impossible task. Uh, the young people of 14, 15, 16 years of age can uh, have uh, uh, an income six or seven times what uh, the government is giving them as a student uh, because uh, the organized crime has the money and uh, you cannot uh, defeat the organized crime as long as there is a market for these drugs and the markets are the markets are outside uh, the mexican government control they they are all over the world basically in the united states but uh, organized crime has a special market in australia for example mm -hmm. in europe in asia my god how do you compete uh, with your uh, social programs and uh, this huge amount of money and the sense of importance they give you a gun uh, you can kill somebody with impunity you feel like god when you are 16 17 uh, 18 years old that's uh, that's uh, the 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 failure i think that failure could be for uh, with amlo or with any other government now what is the the, the success uh, well i think that is more an idea it's a kind of hope it's a kind of utopia that he has been uh, selling to his followers that mexico can change that uh, is hope hope is is his most uh, um, evident achievement he has a, a daily press conference uh, it can last one hour one hour and a half and uh, uh, the uh, newspaper uh, people are asking questions and sometimes uh, it's a bitter exchange but he's trying to explain every day what he is doing uh, why he is doing why some things are failing and why he expects to correct in the future so this constant uh, contact uh, with the uh, with public opinion and uh, trying uh, to to create an atmosphere of a government that is really deeply concerned with what is important for the lower classes i think that uh, that's the only thing that can explain that uh, the support is now going up in this very difficult economic and uh, time. Uh, I, I don't have another explanation. Well, you mentioned uh, on the national, you mentioned security is the greatest failure and that this goes well beyond his administration. You mentioned the National Guard what about the critique some have made that a significant portion of the National Guard, 20, 30 percent, is involved with apprehending Central American migrants in Mexico? Well, I don't think that they are apprehending uh, the Central Americans. They are inhibited. <laughs> they are just pushing them back they are uh, they don't take them and send uh, to a uh, kind of jail or something like that they try not to cross mexico and that is uh, the reason is trump because he made very clear that unless mexico uh, do something serious about stopping central americans he can retaliate putting tariffs in mexican exports so you don't have an alternative uh, andres manuel said at the beginning we will welcome uh, the central americans they are part of ours we are like they and they are like us uh, 
that's not uh, the position anymore because a third factor uh, is not Mexico, Central America. It has never been all the foreign policy of Mexico has always another actor since 18, since the middle of the 19th century, the United States. And it's uh, the pressure of the United States that uh, is forcing Andres Manuel to use the National Guard. And now it's not one third, because when the figures were out, the National Guard was still very small. Yes, it's a third of a very small uh, group. Now he is thinking of 100,000 plus National Guards uh, all over Mexico. But yes, uh, he didn't want to do that. He said that he will not do that, and he did. Because uh, it's real politics. You cannot deal with the United States uh, in your own terms. At the end, you have to deal with the terms that the most powerful country uh, puts uh, on the table. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned Trump. Let me go to a question from Miguel uh, uh, in Palo Alto. How would you compare AMLO's response to COVID with right-wing populist Trump and Bolsonaro? Well, uh, uh, I, th I will start by something very obvious. There is seven days a week a uh, press conference, one hour press conference by the medical staff in charge of COVID. Uh, Andres Manuel very seldom talks about COVID. He said from the very beginning, this is not my field. I don't know anything about this. So I will uh, let those who are experts to do their thing. Uh, and sometimes in the morning uh, press conferences, he brings the uh, secretary of health and the undersecretary, that is the guy that is really in charge of, of all this, to explain, to use graphics and to, but he is not like Trump and Bolsonaro, willing to tell you what to do uh, to uh, inject um, very peculiar things that uh, uh, Trump said uh, that will be a good medicine uh, or something, some crazy things like that. He is not involved in the daily business of uh, the pandemic. Of course, many uh, adversaries are saying, well, these doctors, these medical experts are not particularly good, uh, but that's, <laughs> those are the ones that we have. Uh, uh, but the, the, in essence, the difference is that Bolsonaro and Trump take uh, uh, the, the stage, uh, they are at the center of the stage of the fight against uh, coronavirus. Uh, Andres Manuel, no. And you have to accept uh, that even if you are against uh, Andres Manuel and his policies and so on, you couldn't see the things that you saw in Italy or in Spain of overcrowded uh, hospitals and things like that. He began to uh, build new facilities and uh, to use lots of money to fight uh, as best as the medical Mexican medical establishment can to fight COVID. Well, let me follow up with an intriguing question from Ivan in Albany. How can you, how to be serious critics regarding the failures of the AMLO administration when the extreme right begins to organize against him? Well, uh, the right is trying to organize, yes. They don't have leaders. 
the, they don't have parties because the parties of the right, uh, PAN, PRI, uh, PRD that used to be at the left, Movimiento Ciudadano that was in the middle, all this uh, mixture of parties, um, as I saw, as I show you in the in the last slide, they had very little support, and uh, uh, Jorge Cepeda Patterson, uh, that is a columnist uh, and an opinion writer, said it two days ago or three days ago. The right need a uh, and uh, the equivalent of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, and they don't have. There is no Andres Manuel on the other side. Uh, they have, probably they have economic resources, a lot, but they don't have the leadership. They don't have the, the plan, the project, uh, an idea to sell uh, to the people, except that we are against Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. But what is the positive uh, uh, alternative? What they are offering? Um, they still have to find an idea. Probably they will find one someday. Not, I don't know, in a few months, and uh, probably they will have a, a, a will find a leader. But they are in disarray because they were <laughs> in charge of Mexico for about 100 years, pre and pan. Uh, and look at the mess they left. So there is lack of legitimacy on the part of the right. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go in a, in, a, in a bit of a different area. Uh, how would you explain the fact that Mexico is one of the few large economies in the world that has not had a large aggressive stimulus uh, uh, package in place to expand the economy at this time of crisis? Well, there is a, um, um, how can I say, a, a dialogue uh, uh, going on and, and uh, the, the, there is, we still have to, uh, to find a, a way out, but Andres Manuel doesn't want to get in, uh, in debt. Uh, the national debt is already high. Uh, he feels that he doesn't have uh, room for maneuvering. He doesn't want to ask for a loan to the International Monetary Fund or something like that. He said, uh, I don't, I'm dead set against uh, asking um, the foreign institutions. Uh, others said, don't worry about that. You just do that. And uh, if the debt goes up, 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 and up, it's not your business because you will not be there when they <laughs> have to pay. But uh, Andres Manuel is saying, we are paying a lot of, uh, because the debt that others created for me in the past, and I don't want to continue in this uh, uh, in this road of uh, indebtedness. That's one way to explain it. If you don't want to uh, have a fiscal uh, deficit, if you don't want to ask for loans, uh, he said, what I am doing is keeping the government uh, uh, my English is failing me, uh, to be uh, in, in a, a strict diet, we are, uh, lowering the, the salaries of the top bureaucracy. We are not uh, accepting uh, waste. Uh, we are, he's like a Franciscan. Uh, San Francis will be very pleased to be in the, this government because they don't <laughs> have almost anything. Uh, so he's restricting uh, public expenditure, perhaps too much, perhaps too much. Uh, 
But he said, we have to do that. We have to do that. Um, on the other hand, he doesn't want to give, uh, to save enterprises, big enterprises. He said, that's not what uh, my government is going to do. We are going to give to the lower classes, to the lower ranks, uh, is small but many credits, créditos a la palabra, uh, without bureaucracy, without intermediaries. And so he is spending the money in those, uh, in those areas, but no, he doesn't want uh, to, to increase the uh, national debt. And that is uh, why they are discussing right now. Colleagues of mine said, no, 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 we have to go into debt. Even if, it's, uh, if it looks uh, uh, extremely high, this is an extreme situation. And uh, we should be uh, getting into deficit and huge deficits. And he said, no, and that's it. <laughs> uh, Nobody is moving the president out of this position. Perhaps he's wrong. Perhaps he's too extreme. Yes, I think it's too extreme. He said, even if the left is asking me for a, um, a huge deficit, I will not hear their complaints and their demands. Well, uh, here's a question from Jorge in Guadalajara. Uh, do you think that the current government has surpassed the neoliberal governments in terms of human development? Surpass, uh, I think that they want to surpass in terms of human uh, development. All depends on what are your indicators of human development. But yes, they want, they want to make a, a, a mark in uh, human development. Uh, that those are the 30 social programs. Uh, I don't know how much they will be uh, willing to go because they don't have uh, resources. But they want, for example, he wants to create 100 new universities. But how come? <laughs> where do you want? Where, where do you get the teachers, the faculty, uh, the buildings? Uh, the scholarships, uh, he said, uh, he has a very revolutionary view of uh, university students. He said, nobody should uh, be thrown out of a university. If you apply for a university, you will have to get a place. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you are not well prepared, well, it's the uh, the fault of the previous education, the previous, uh, your class uh, background. The universities have to put a special emphasis in poor students and open universities everywhere. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I, 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 I have been working in a very elitist university, public university, that is El Colegio de Mexico, that is always with examinations and entrance examinations and things like that, just like your universities. Uh, Andres Manuel said, no, no entrance examination. At the end, you have to be able to be a, a good uh, professional, even if it takes two, three time, three more uh, time to, to, to get your degree. So uh, that's an example of uh, something that we can introduce into the human development and index of uh, uh, university students. But how, how with what resources? Uh, he has uh, this idea of 100 new universities in poor neighborhoods all over Mexico. Uh, he wants people to study, 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 study. Well, there is no lack of will, there is lack of money. Uh, here's a question that takes us back to what you briefly mentioned 
USMCA and NAFTA. Uh, this is from Danielle in Berkeley. Uh, what are AMLO's priorities in terms of worker rights uh, amidst the COVID-19 crisis? Does he intend to implement the labor reforms in Mexico? Well, I think that the, uh, he intends to implement them. <laughs> uh, he puts in charge of the Labor Department a very young lady, uh, very young, without experience, but full of energy uh, and um, uh, committed. He, she's committed against corruption and things like that. She wants uh, um, to give labor because his father is a labor lawyer. He, he, she comes from a, a family of uh, abogados laboristas. So she is on the side of the, of the workers. But <laughs> there are, uh, the reality is very tough. When COVID was uh, really at the highest, the exporters to the United States in uh, this agreement wanted the factories to, to work, to start running as fast as possible and as soon as possible, even with the COVID. And uh, the government made a, allowed them to start working, even if it was dangerous because the pressure on the part of the, in, uh, the people in charge of, of this uh, um, export uh, sector that was uh, uh, producing for the United States, for the aerospace industry, for the automobile industry, they were desperate. And they said, if you don't do that, we will look for another place uh, and we will be out of Mexico as soon as we can. So uh, they allowed uh, these factories to open uh, with the danger of contracting COVID and some people just happen to get COVID in their factories. Everybody knew that that, that was going to happen, but the pressure was there. What can you do if your economy is going to the temp, uh, percent of the uh, gross national gross domestic product down uh, it's a, a there was no no really no no possibility of negotiating things uh, sadly we have time for two more questions uh, the next question will be from Philip what do you think of AMLO's energy policy? Energy, uh, yes, he has been criticized uh, by many people here because he's not uh, uh, doing many things in uh, regard to the uh, clean energy, green energy. He is uh, putting all his effort in Pemex because Pemex is for him uh, not only an enterprise, it, it used to be the core of Mexican nationalism uh, that was destroyed by the uh, neoliberal governments and he wants to recuperate oil, uh, Pemex, uh, um, a public uh, enterprise that for a while was the gem of the crown of uh, the Mexican um, uh, public sector, and that now is just a disaster. So he wants to give a second life to Pemex. And that's why some people are saying, no, 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 you don't do that. You have to go to the green, clean energy. Uh, to hell with Pemex. Pemex is now a history, is gone. And uh, Andres Manuel uh, is uh, perhaps he's thinking too much in the, 
he is always, always using history in his discourse, always. And he is looking at a, the past in which Pemex was uh, the core of uh, the Mexican economy, providing uh, the Mexican industry with cheap energy. And he wants to recreate that part of the uh, Mexican past. And he's investing uh, a lot of money in the new uh, refinery, uh, create reshaping old refineries, and uh, trying to clean up uh, from corruption Pemex. That is a, is Hercules uh, that has to be there because Pemex was full of corruption. It's still a, a problem, but he is, he, he is looking only at Pemex. He talks about the other uh, um, energy, but no, I don't think that his heart is uh, on the side of the new energy. He wants to, to recuperate the old, uh, the old Pemex. Let me squeeze in here before our last question, a follow-up to this, since you, you, you raised you know, his commitment to Pemex and oil. What about an example like the Maya train, uh, which has been opposed by a number of the indigenous groups in the area in which it's gonna be built? Half of it, my understanding in the latest iteration, will continue to run on diesel. Uh, how would you explain his position uh, on the Maya train? Well, uh, on the one hand, it's quite easy because uh, with the free trade agreement, the north of Mexico was uh, becoming more developed, more modern, uh, more integrated to the United States and the south of Mexico where he was born, the South was left. Uh, it was another Mexico, a Mexico that was more uh, closer to Central America than to the real Mexico from center to north. And now he wants, uh, as, as in, in this kind of class uh, warfare that is going on in Mexico right now, a peaceful but uh, a war, nevertheless, he wants to change priorities. Now is the South. Now is the South, not the North. And uh, uh, what can uh, the South exploit in the 19th century, beginning the 20th century, and again and, uh, in Yucatan? But there is nothing like that. Now is tourism because it's, uh, it's easier to bring uh, dollars through the tourist industry. And there is the Maya uh, uh, legacy there. So this train, he, he is always saying that we are not destroying anything. We are using the old railroad that was there and it was owned by the government, the right, uh, el derecho de vía, uh, it was not used, but it was there. We are going to use the old way uh, that belongs to the government to have a new uh, railroad. We are not, uh, we are committed ourselves not to destroy uh, the, the nature, but it, it has to be some kind of destruction because you cannot, uh, introduce something modern uh, into this uh, kind of environment, this Selva Baja uh, of uh, Yucatan. But he's one time and again and again and again and again saying, we are not going to cause a, a ecological problem because the, the old tracks were, are there, are there, but useless and we are going to inject money, we are going to bring tourists, and we are going to bring a new life to the economy of the southern part of Mexico. 
Well, our, but right before our final question, I just wanted to mention you brought up earlier uh, the new labor minister, uh, Luis Alcalde. Uh, <laughs> she is a recent recipient of a, the equivalent of a master's degree, an LLM degree from the law school here at Berkeley. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Fine. I like her a lot. So I was reluctant to let this conclude without <laughs> at least mentioning that. Uh, <laughs> Thank the, you for mentioning it, uh, Ali. <laughs> the final question uh, is what happens in the United States on November 3rd, the presidential election here. What do you see of the consequences of Mexico, depending on which way this election goes? And what might a new president in the United States be able to do with Mexico that you would view as critical? Yes, uh, a new president, uh, almost by default, has to return to normalcy. What we are experiencing now uh, in the relationship with the United States is a uh, the lack of a compass. We don't know what the president is going to do next uh, week or next day. It's, uh, we cannot predict, uh, we cannot plot what uh, is going to be the main avenues of US-Mexican relationship because it's unpredictable, Trump uh, and his policies. He started in, uh, 2016, uh, bashing Mexico, he, he saying that uh, we were a, one of the big problems for the United States. And we enter center stage uh, in that election without <laughs> wanting to be there. And we were uh, uh, astonished, uh, irritated, furious. Uh, another four years of this. Uh, will be very difficult for Mexico. Although Andres Manuel said that I have a good relationship with Trump, he has to say that. Uh, I don't believe him just for a minute that he likes uh, the continuation of uh, Trump pres Trump's presidency in the United States. Not for a minute. But he has to be very polite and he has uh, to be very careful with what he says. Uh, with a personality like Trump. If there is another president, I think that normalcy will come again into this relationship that is, a, is, a, is complex, is full of problems. Now we have the problem of the water, of the water of the uh, Rio Grande or uh, Rio Bravo that we are not com uh, if, paying the U.S. the amount of water that uh, the Treaty of 1944 uh, is uh, forced Mexico to do because we have problems in Chihuahua. There is always uh, some problem. Uh, the U.S.-Mexican relationship is not problem-free, but, but never will be, never. But if we can have a normal presidency in the U.S., if we can deal with a normal people, probably we can solve the problems in a better way. Well, in conclusion, thank you so much for being with us today, Lorenzo Mayer, and for your informed and thoughtful comments. Uh, we sometimes forget there are few relationships that the United States has anywhere in the world more important than Mexico. Not simply a 2,000 mile shared border, a shared history for better and for worse. Uh, extraordinary exchanges among people, uh, a very large trading relationship. And as the late Adolfo Aguilar Zimzer once said, we are not simply neighbors, we, are, we have become overlapping societies. So we appreciate your being here with us today. We look forward to doing other webinars on Mexico from different perspectives as to where things are today and where they might go. 
uh, and we look forward uh, to the participants here joining us in the future and we thank all the questions we received, and we will send you some of the questions that we did not have time to ask. Okay, so, um, thank you for your invitation. I am pleased uh, to be in this conversation. Thanks a lot. And we look forward to having you back then. So <laughs> with that, we will conclude. Thank you. <laughs>